we're so delighted to have you here. I know that uh, uh, the weather in Ottawa is so welcoming these days that uh, uh, it may have kind of filled away uh, the, the audience. So this is uh, most wonderful event for the faculty. It's the Lucien Conference Commemorative the Giving Mark and Electrical Research Education so our eighth annual conference in the memory of Peter Martin. Uh, Peter Martin uh, was a graduate of this faculty in 1978. When she passed away in 2006, her colleagues at the Institute of Canada decided to do something to uh, commemorate her life. And it's in that context that uh, we created this uh, annual lecture. And the lecture is obviously supported by her, her great colleagues from the Insurance Bureau, Jim Lingard, uh, Mario Fiorino, and Randy Gondes, as well as the Canadian Bar Association, uh, Privacy and Access Law Section, and the law firm of Captain National. This is our eighth annual Deidre Martin Lecture, and we're delighted uh, to have uh, with us uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Benjamin Gould, who is Professor and Associate Dean Academic Affairs at the newly named Peter A. Howard School of Law at the University of British Columbia. Uh, I'm particularly pleased today to welcome among us uh, many of Ms. Martin's uh, colleagues and supporters of this, of this lecture, Stephen Lingard, Randy Bondus, uh, Jennifer Lalonde, and uh, Tony from the Canadian Bar Association, and we are also honored to have uh, Deidre's family with us. Deidre's son, son, Connor Washi, and her brother, Frank, and family members, Mo and Sam Barnaby. Thank you all for coming, and uh, Tempest Magna, uh, Mr. Lingard, uh, to say a couple words on um, Thank you very much, Dean. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs, je suis Stephen Lingard, le directeur principal service juridique et chef de la protection des renseignements personnels du Bureau d'assurance du Canada. My name is Stephen Lingard and I'm director of legal services and chief privacy officer at Insurance Bureau of Canada. And I'm privileged to make some brief comments today about Deirdre Martin, whose memory is being honored by this lecture. Uh, the Dean acknowledged the presence here today of some of Deirdre's family members. Uh, and they've attended all of these lectures, so thank you very much for your continued support. I'd also like to give a shout out to some uh, people in the privacy community who, who have continued to come to this lecture. Uh, Heather Black, former assistant privacy commissioner of Canada, and Goldsmith, former legal counsel of OPC, Suzanne Moran, uh, numerous corporate places, David um, thank you very much for coming to the lecture today. Your, uh, your presence here is greatly appreciated. And as the Dean mentioned, like my colleague Randy Bunnish is here with me today. Mario is unable to attend. He has a, another commitment in Kitchener of all places, if you can believe it. <laughs> <laughs> and he shows that over Ottawa. Um, I'll now say a few words about Deirdre. Um, after working in private practice and also as in-house counsel for several years, Deirdre joined IDC's legal services in 1998, where she worked until her passing in 2006. Deirdre and I worked together on a wide variety of issues related to the then new private sector privacy law of PETA and the then new provincial private sector privacy laws in Alberta, Quebec, and British Columbia. Time passes so quickly, it's hard to remember back when we didn't have privacy laws. I'm sure for a number of years they've always been around, but I remember, and Suzanne and Heather and Anne and David were involved, were knowledgeable as well, when the question was, should we have a privacy law? <laughs> should we have a voluntary privacy code, the CSA privacy code? So, but time passes by, we've had these laws for a number of years. Here's her approach privacy, she did every file she worked on. She immersed herself in the topic and considered not only the legal issues and the interpretation of the words in legalese, but also how these laws would affect individual citizens. Anyone who worked with Deirdre knew that she felt very strongly about protecting the privacy rights of insurance consumers. She built upon her knowledge of the property and casualty insurance industry and became an authority on the practical issues involved in the application of the privacy laws to our industry 
and to the citizens who bought insurance. He was well aware that things keep on changing, and that what was established law or best practices one day might well change and need to be reconsidered and updated. He knew the value of hearing from others of different views and new approaches. Deirdre was a very proud graduate of the University of Ottawa Law School, which made your law school an obvious choice at which we could establish a memorial privacy lecture in Deirdre's name. And as being mentioned, the first lecture was in 2008. This is the eighth such lecture. The lectures are intended to give you, you being the students of the University of Ottawa Law Faculty and the members of the Ottawa Legal Community, an opportunity to hear from leading privacy speakers on new and emerging issues and challenges, and today's lecture deals with one such issue. We hope that this lecture may inspire you to follow Deirdre's example and to become knowledgeable and effective proponents of privacy rights and protection in your legal and business careers. I'd like to thank Dean de Rossier and her colleagues for their work in organizing these lectures including the selection of world-class speakers. Um, and this year, we are very privileged to have Dr. Benjamin Gould from the University of British Columbia as our speaker. Thank you, thank you very much for coming to today's lecture, and I'll turn the podium. I think to Madeline. Mm -hmm. I can introduce the speaker. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Il est un grand plaisir d'introduire notre conférencier invité, le professeur Benjamin Gould. As you know, Professor Gould is a professor at the Allard School of Law at the University of British Columbia, which he joined in January 2010. Before that, from 2003 until 2009, he was a lecturer at the University of Oxford Faculty of Law and a fellow in law at Somerville College, where he taught criminal law, criminology, and tort. Prior to taking up his post at Oxford, he taught law at the University of New Data in Japan and criminology at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York. Professor Gould holds, holds degrees in law and economics from the University of Tasmania, as well as a BCL and doctorate degree from the University of Oxford, where he studied as, as a Rhodes Scholar. His major research interests include privacy rights, the use of surveillance technologies by the police and intelligence communities, and the rhetoric and language of human rights. He's the author of numerous works on privacy surveillance and security, including CCTV and Policing, published by Oxford University Press, and Security and Human Rights, published by Heart Publishing. Among his more recent publications are works on social and political dimensions of privacy, the moral economy of security, and the development, marketing, and public response to personal passion issues. Currently, Professor Gould is working on two research projects, the first, a study of how security products are bought, sold, and consumed. And the second, a major field study of undercover police <coughs> and covert surveillance practices in the UK. Professor Gould has served as an independent advisor to the UK Identity and Passport Service on matters of regulation and data sharing, and has acted as special legal advisor to a major House of Lords inquiry into surveillance and data collection in the UK. He's currently a member of the BC Information and Privacy Commissioner's External Advisory Board. Without further ado, I'd like to invite the Professor to go to the podium to speak about picking boxes and telling stories, privacy, data sharing, and the construction of identity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's the last one of those. Uh, it's at the bar I'm actually most proud of at the moment. I'm having a wonderful yeah. time on the Privacy Commission's external advisory board. So it's a lovely place to end the, end the introduction. Um, I want to begin by saying thank you um, for the invitation to deliver this memorial lecture uh, and the opportunity to reflect on a topic that I've become increasingly interested in um, over the last few years. Although I'm always uh, quite interested to speak about privacy and surveillance, particularly to a broad audience, it's also particularly satisfying uh, to be here at the University of Ottawa. Uh, even before I moved to Canada approximately five years ago, I was very aware of the wonderful work that's being done here on issues of privacy, identity and surveillance. And it's great to actually have finally have a chance to come here and meet some of the people whose work I've followed uh, and admired for many years. So I'm looking forward to not just today, but also the symposium tomorrow and hopefully the reception and dinner afterwards. Um, I also want to say uh, thank you to Stephen, Randy and Mario uh, for the support of this lecture series. Um, and to the Privacy and Access Law Section of the Canadian Bar Association and Sasha Martin, Martin for their co-sponsorship. Um, I, um, I didn't know Deirdre, but everything I hear uh, in the preparation of this lecture suggests she was a, 
a powerful and important advocate for privacy both in this province and nationally. And I just want to say it's actually a great pleasure to be asked to give a lecture um, like this. So thank you. Um, so speaking of the lecture, uh, I have an unfortunate tendency to use public occasions like this to test ideas. Um, part of the reason for that is that my ideas change between when I agree to do something and when I actually end up doing it. So when, I, when uh, Madeline got in touch and asked me for a, asked me if I do this lecture, and the answer was of course yes, and then asked me for a topic, and the answer was I don't know, um, and then writing one and an abstract and all the sorts of things that go into that. Uh, that was some months ago, and I spent quite a lot of time thinking about the abstract and the topic and the like, and have changed my mind many, many, many times about what I want to say. I was changing my mind on the aeroplane yesterday, um, and even this morning. And so, you are, uh, like many of the audiences that I've spoken to over the years, a bit of a test subject. This is where I often bring these ideas to test, and, and particularly in an audience like this, with people who really have an enormous amount of expertise around issues of privacy, uh, this is a wonderful opportunity for me as well. So I very much hope uh, in the questions we'll have a chance to, to sort of go through some of these ideas. You'll see at the end, I make various claims which uh, the sociologist and uh, legal philosopher in me think are wonderfully interesting. Uh, the privacy lawyer interest in me is slightly horrified by them, uh, both in terms of their scope and in terms of their implementation. So these are the bits that I'm looking to the audience particularly for some help in terms of fleshing out. Um, you'll see I don't have any PowerPoint slides. That's uh, because in my career I've had a number of disasters with PowerPoint. Um, and I finally, about eight years ago, decided just to leave it all behind and to rely purely on the power of the voice. Um, but you'll be happy to hear that the structure of this lecture isn't uh, especially complicated. Um, in essence, I'm going to outline two related arguments, both of which I believe provide support for the claim that we need to deepen our commitment to informational privacy and the principles of informational self-determination. On the one hand, I'm going to argue that advances in information communication technologies have led to a situation where our traditional narrative notions of identity are under threat. And unless we strengthen our commitment to privacy and informational self-determination, we're at risk of our identity, at least in terms of the ones that matter to the state, being reduced to a product of ticking boxes. That's the first half of the title. On the other hand, I'm also going to argue that the same advances in information and communication technologies have led to a situation where we are now faced with an unprecedented opportunity to expand and enhance our narrative identities. And again, unless we strengthen our commitment to informational self-determination and privacy, we risk losing an opportunity, a very important opportunity, to tell stories about ourselves and enhance our sense of self and personal identity. And then I'm going to conclude by arguing effectively that whilst Canada has been at the forefront of many discussions about privacy, and has led the way in terms of the development of things like fair information practices and the promotion of privacy by design, there is still a lot more we need to do. Specifically, I think we've reached the point where we need to take steps to enable individuals to exercise rights to informational self-determination in the court, in addition to seeking remedies to regulators, and to also start a conversation about whether it's possible for individuals to have meaningful property rights in personal information. Okay, so that's, that's the broad structure of the piece and, and I'll keep coming back to that as we work through. I want to start the lecture by spending a little bit of time uh, talking about identity. If you're anything like most people, and perhaps like me, you probably don't spend a lot of time thinking about your identity. For the most part, our identity is something we take for granted and only dwell on when we find ourselves in a situation where we need to prove who we are or when our identity is challenged for some reason. Examples of this typically happen when we travel at airports and borders, and when we interact with organisations and institutions. When we want to buy something online, we often have to identify ourselves in some way, through an email or through a credit card. When we go to the bank, we need to identify ourselves with our card or our driver's licence. And when we want to, want to access some state service, our identity becomes even more important. But despite the fact that identity is something that most of us don't necessarily spend a lot of time thinking about, our identity shapes and mediates almost every interaction we have with the world, and with the other people who share it with us. It will come as no surprise then that scholars and academics, and in particular philosophers and psychologists, have spent a lot of time thinking about identity. Accordingly, there are many different theories of identity. Some of them, which date back to philosophers like Locke, focus on consciousness and the relationship between memory and self. But as someone interested in privacy and in human rights more generally, the theory of identity that has held the most appeal for me is that of narrative identity. According to this theory, 
Our individual identity is akin to an ongoing and ever-developing story. By telling stories about ourselves, to ourselves and to others, we construct a narrative that eventually becomes our identity. In part, the construction of this narrative occurs through the interaction of three different versions of the self. Namely, our personal identity, the thing that we are, who we are, our self-conception, who we think we are, and our social self, the self that we show others. Now, you can say a lot more about the interactions between these different aspects of the self, but in the current context, it's enough to say that the flows between them are multidirectional. That is to say, within this narrative framework, the development and construction of the social self, the self that exists in public and through which we interact with others, influences our self-conception and in turn influences our personal identity. Now, an important part of this theory is a recognition of the fact that there doesn't have to be just one social self. Instead, there can be many such selves, and they may, and they may or may not be connected to each other. Now, for me, part of the appeal of this theory is that it resonates with common sense understandings of the self, and also identifies that identity is also, or recognises rather, that identity is always changing and developing. But another part of the attraction is that this, this theory by recognising the possibility of multiple social selves and various self-conceptions, provides a role for privacy that goes beyond the concern with keeping secrets or shielding us from the harms that might result from the disclosure of sensitive information. For me, one of the strongest justifications for privacy has always been that it enables us to keep different aspects of ourselves separate, and in so doing allows us to explore different facets of our identity without having our actions being taken out of context. In this way, a measure of privacy, by enabling me to keep my social self separate, allows me to be a different person at work from the one I am at home, and a different person with my co-worker from the one I am with my children, and to ensure the views expressed in one of those contexts do not necessarily find their way into the other. Now, I don't want to say much more about the narrative identity for now. It's just as much as sort of put it on the table, and I'll keep coming back to it. I... In the course of preparing this lecture, I became aware, however, of a, a quite a good recent book uh, on this notion of identity and its relationship to social self, and in particular, uh, information technology. It's a book by Luciano Floridi called The Fourth Revolution. I'm going to talk about Floridi's ideas towards the end of this lecture, but for anyone who's interested in narrative identities, I'd recommend uh, picking up that book. It's a wonderfully interesting read. Okay, so I mentioned a few minutes ago that my interest in identity and in narrative ideas of identity originally came out of a broader interest in privacy and human rights. I should also have added that this interest is fu was fueled by concern about the spread of state surveillance and the potential dangers of electronic monitoring, data matching and state profiling. One of the central challenges of the modern state has always been to find ways in which to identify citizens. Passports, identity cards and social security numbers all represent attempts to ensure the individual is readily and unmistakably distinguishable from others. Indeed, without stable identities and reliable mechanisms for identification, it is difficult for states to exercise any hold over those who live within their borders or to ensure that they're able to protect themselves from internal or external threats. At a more mundane level, however, reliable methods of identification are also essential for the running of anything other than the most minimal state and the delivery of anything more than the most minimal services. Now, some years ago when I was sort of steeped in the post-9-11 discourse around security and surveillance, I argued with process of identification and the sharing of information gathered by different but connected state organisations has fundamentally changed in recent years. At a macro level, I argue that the growing concern with risk and security, particularly in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks, has led states to significantly increase their surveillance activities and to treat the management of risk as one of their core concerns. In addition to this macro shift, there have also been other developments that have led to an intensification of surveillance a deepening obsession with identification and authentication, and the increasing use of profiling and data matching by the state. For the sake of this lecture, I just want to mention three of these developments. The first is that advances in surveillance technology and techniques have now made it possible for governments to collect many previously unavailable forms of information, such as digital recordings of activity in public via CCTV, information about activities online, and records of communication between people via email, mobile phones, and the like. Second, developments in information technology have made it much easier for government information to share this information amongst themselves and with private institutions. 
and to draw additional information from the public domain. And finally, advances in data matching and the development of so-called algorithmic surveillance techniques have made it possible to automate many of the decision-making processes that rely on this information. Now, some years ago when I wrote about this, I argued that these developments have led to increased reliance on what might be called categorical identities. In contrast to narrative identities, these categorical identities are not based on the stories we tell about ourselves or a product of the interplay between our self-conceptions and our social selves. Instead, they are developed through processes of identification, authentication and processes that aim at identifying individuals and assessing their status and eligibility. Put another way, categorical identities are the product of questions like what are the defining characteristics, gender, age, race of the individual? Is this individual a member of a particular state-defined group or category, such as a citizen or non-citizen? And what claims and liabilities does this individual have in relation to the state? In many respects, we consider this categorical identity as a version or an evolution of the bureaucratic file, and that it forms the basis of administrative decision-making as regards individuals. But where the categorical identity differs from the traditional bureaucratic file, however, is that thanks to information in, uh, advances in information technology, if you can be communicated and shared between agencies of the state with incredible ease. And in addition, because the categorical identity is typically the product of digital technologies and information processing, it has the potential to become incredibly detailed. Now, I think it's right to say that most people probably don't think about the relationships of the state in terms of a competition between their own narrative accounts of themselves and some categorical identity that's constructed for them. Because, uh, because largely until very recently, categorical identity and their real effects on everyday life have been relatively limited. These two conceptions of identity only come into competition when the categorical overlaps with the narrative or contradicts or support, supplants it. And so long as categorical identities are based on a narrow range of information, the possibility of such conflict remains relatively limited. But what I'd argue is that as governments collect more and more personal information and advances in information and communication technology make it easier to store, process and retrieve that information, the complexity and scope of the categorical identities they construct gradually increases, as does the potential for conflict with other conceptions of identity like the narrative. In addition, because it's necessary for the state to assume that the information contained in an individual's file is accurate, it's inevitable that a categorical identity that emerges from that file is preferred to any alternative narrative account. Someone may regard herself, for example, as a good mother who's made a new life for her children by moving to another country and cleaning other people's houses for cash. For the state, however, if the information contained in a file says otherwise, then it's a categorical identity that will ultimately prevail and the same person may be seen as a single parent, unemployed and an illegal immigrant. Now this idea of the categorical identity is not a new one. Many, many people have written about how our interactions with state in an age of electronic surveillance and information processing have in effect given rise to the existence of digital doubles or digital doppelgangers. Yet while some people have focused on how reliance on our digital identities can lead to discrimination, denial and exclusion, my interest has always been on the effect that the existence of these doubles has on our own sense of self. When the narrative and the categorical collide and the categorical prevails, this can amount to the state effectively taking ownership of my identity and telling me that I am not who I think I am. Now if you think, as I do, that one of the most important and valuable things about being an autonomous human being is the capacity to build a self, to be, other, to be the author of one's own narrative, then the existence of a state-constructed double is very worrisome. Now, back when I first wrote about these issues in 2006, I argued that countries like the UK and the US needed to expand their existing privacy and data protection frameworks to embrace ideas of informational self-determination and principles of privacy by design. In particular, I argue that shifting the focus to informational self-determination, the idea that individuals should have control over their information, in the context of identity, avoids one of the great ironies of traditional privacy rights, namely that individuals are required to identify what they regard as private in order to protect themselves from unwanted intrusions, despite the fact that the mere act of claiming something is private tells the state that it is something the individual regards as valuable. However, a commitment to principles of informational self-determination, 
and with it fair information principles, reverses this burden by requiring the state or any other user of personal information to justify why the use does not infringe upon the individual's autonomy and his or her expectation about how to control how their personal information is used. And so, like many privacy scholars, I looked to countries like Canada and Germany for models and suggested that what we needed were strong regulators who were able to protect the identity interests of individuals through the promotion of fair information practices and the fundamental idea that an individual's personal information is their own and that the individual must better control how their personal information is collected, used and disclosed. In effect, I argue that by giving individuals a right to informational self-determination, the law can rein in the state's natural tendency to identify, classify and undermine the narrative identities that we rely on for our interactions with others and our own sense of self. Now, looking back, and, and in part preparing for this lecture has forced me to look back uh, even more intently than I might have done otherwise, I can now say that I, at that time I viewed the idea of informational self-determination and privacy rights for that matter as largely defensive. That is, the call for informational self-determination and greater personal privacy was a demand for effective, more effective countermeasures designed to limit the ability of the state to create, expand and promulgate categorical identities that represented a threat to more na nuanced narrative notions of the self. To quote the title of this lecture again, my aim at the time was to protect people from having their identities reduced to a series of tick boxes. Now, while I still think these arguments are, are valid, and I still believe that privacy and informational self-determination are essential if individuals are to resist the state's worst tendencies towards identification and classification, I now think there's much more to the story. Looking back, I consider that implicit in many of my arguments was an assumption that digital identities are inescapably reductive and limited, and as a result they cannot be real identities. Returning to the framework I set out earlier, I was working to the assumption that even if our online activities can be said to constitute some form of social self, it's a lesser version of the social self than the ones we present in the physical world. And as a result, it, has, it is less meaningful for self-conception and ultimately our personal identity. Yet, while this might be true when we're talking about the sort of categorical identities that are created for us by the state, primarily because these identities are the product of the state's effort to classify and identify us according to the state's own aims and objectives, I'm not so sure of the digital identities we create for ourselves in the course of our online lives. In contrast to the state's picture of me, for example, my Facebook profile is, to some extent at least, the product of many, many years of freely made choices. In much the same way as the self I present at my workplace or in various social situations is the product of similar choices. Equally, the profile I maintain on various online forums where I share opinions, views and personal experiences on a wide range of issues is also the product of my choices and reflectively informed by the responses of other forum users. In a different but related way, my Amazon profile, which perhaps knows me better than anybody, <laughs> is also digital identities as a product of my choices albeit one that is constantly informed by Amazon's attempts to sell me more things. Uh, I experienced one of those this morning where Amazon sent me an email with 10 books about the network self that I haven't read. Um, which is a little arresting when you're about to give a lecture on the topic and suddenly you get an email <laughs> at 8.30 in the morning saying, there are all these books you didn't know about. Would you like to buy them? <laughs> yes, not today. So, um, but crucially, the key distinction between our online social media activities and our responses to states is that we aren't just ticking boxes or responding to predetermined, functionally driven questions when we're on Facebook. We're telling stories. Now, it's nothing new, and the 10 extra books that I got sent have made this even more apparent, to say that the spread of social media has created a whole new landscape for the spread of ideas, communication, and personal interactions. But keeping to the theme of this lecture, I want to suggest that our online identities are in fact meaningful social selves, or in the words of Floridi, meaningful micro-narratives. They are not, like categorical identities, simply reductive digital shadows or doppelgangers that we have little control over. Instead, they are as much representations of us as the physical spaces we present in the physical world. That is, they contribute to our self-conception, both because they are narr the narratives are products of our choices and also because they are informed by the responses of others to those choices and as such they form an important part of our personal identity. Now, if you adhere to the narrative conception of identity I set out at the beginning of the lecture, 
This is an important claim. If our activities and the stories we tell about ourselves online are narratives in the same way as the activities and stories we tell about ourselves in the real world, then we start to look at questions of privacy and informational self-determination quite differently. What you begin to see is that the development and maintenance of personal identity is infinitely ba- inf- intimately bound up with flows of information. On this view, privacy must be more than a defensive right, a right to limit the access that others have to us or to keep information secret. Instead, it must be viewed as a right that fundamentally facilitates the development of the self and that, attempt, and that any attempt to undermine privacy represents a threat to individual autonomy and our capacity to determine who we are. Privacy is important in the online space because it allows us to keep our different social selves, our different online profiles and identities, separate, and as a result to manage the way in which those social selves contribute to our self-conception. So I don't, for example, share my political views on forums about my car. In the same way as on Facebook, I don't share my views about cars because I get different feedback. My friends don't want to hear me talk about cars on Facebook any more than my friends on my car forum want to hear me talk about my children. Indeed, we can argue that because there are many more, far more opportunities for others to respond to our social selves when we go online, then there is even more reason to give individuals through privacy rights and a commitment to informational self-determination, the ability to keep those selves apart and to ensure that information disclosed in one context does not find its way into another without our knowledge or consent. Now, it's important to pause at this point and, and note that calls for less privacy and more transparency in our online lives on the grounds that becoming more visible somehow makes us more accountable and ultimately better people fundamentally misunderstands this nature of this idea of identity. Not only is it predicated on besides this promotion of transparency, predicated on the belief, uh, I gather, shared by um, some of the senior executives of Facebook, that we all only have one true identity, but it also underplays the importance of being able to keep, of being able to be different people in different contexts, and how this much, how this contributes to our ability to explore and enjoy different aspects of ourselves. Um, I recently read a wonderful book called The Circle by David Eggers, which imagines a world in which we all have a single unifying online identity and the increasing drive of uh, a company, in this case called The Circle, but clearly uh, meant to be Google, I think it's fair to say, uh, desperately trying to make sure more and more things are linked to that identity and make it more and more transparent. And it's quite a good satire. It plays through the implications of this uh, for various protagonists. And if you, are, if you have an interest in these arguments about transparency, it's a, it's a good read. Okay, so now I'm coming to the sharp end. What does all this mean in practice? And I look at the lawyers in the room because this is where I think we start to have an interesting discussion. What are the implications for acknowledging that online identities and profiles need to be taken seriously and that seen as a valid expression of our efforts to develop our personal or core identities? Well, at a general level, I think this realisation that personal information is constitutive of identity should only strengthen our commitment to the importance of informational self-determination and to see it as a fundamental aspect of the right to privacy. Now, some people are going to be happy to hear that I, I think this leads us to the conclusion that we should give privacy commissioners and other regulators greater powers to ensure that fair information principles are respected and to sanction individuals and organisations that fail to recognise that the misuse of personal information can amount to an attack on an individual's ability to escape their own identity as well as to maintain their <coughs> privacy. But going further, another way in which we could better recognise the intimate relationships between personal information and identity would be to extend our existing privacy protections to enable individuals to avail themselves of a freestanding right to informational self-determination in the court. And that's why I take a deep breath. So I think that one's a hard one to sustain. At present, most of the provincial and federal privacy protections we enjoy are contingent on the ability of regulators to hold state and private organisations accountable for failures to respect individual privacy. And, in the same way, contingent on their resources, their capacity uh, to do that. We also at the provincial level have statutory torts of privacy which in limited circumstances protect individuals from violations of privacy and which are actionable without proof of damage. But if we believe all of us have a fundamental stake in our own identities and that the development and maintenance of those identities are important expressions of individual autonomy, then why shouldn't individuals be able to go to the courts to protect those identities themselves and to enforce rights to informational determination themselves? 
If someone shares my information without my consent or knowledge, why shouldn't I be able to bring an action, possibly in court, seeking damages or at least injunctive relief? Of course, this shouldn't be an independent, uh, an alternative to strong independent regulation, but giving individuals the ability to enforce their right to informational self-determination would, to my mind at any rate, be a positive step forward. Lastly, I want to suggest there's another way in which we can think about all this, a way that may lead to an even more radical conclusion than a freestanding right to informational self-determination. If we take a narrative view of identity and maintain that identity is essentially constituted from all the personal information generated and shared about us, then I think it becomes possible to think, think of this information as a form of personal property. Indeed, you can already see echoes of this approach in the way we now talk about identity theft which explicitly acknowledges that identity is something that can be stolen and misused. But what if we go further and are willing to countenance the possibility that we have in rem rights to the personal information that makes up our identity? This would, I think, have two consequences. First, it would help us to recognise that personal information is valuable in and of itself because it is constituted of identity, of identity and not simply because it's misuse or misappropriation can lead to some sort of harm, particular sort of harm, like an injury to reputation or a loss of commercial interest. It would also, and this may be a better argument, lay bare the fact that although personal information is clearly valuable, very valuable, as the market capitalisation of Facebook stands as a testament to, the failure to think of it as personal property means that the subjects of that information have no direct claim over it. Thinking of personal information as property would, I believe, not only open up the possibility that we should be compensated where our information is used or shared for commercial purposes without our consent, but also provide the foundation for new ways in which the law can protect that information and possibly allow us to benefit from it. Now, I mentioned earlier uh, in the lecture that I found recent work by Floridi, Floridi very helpful in terms of structuring my recent thinking about the relationship between privacy and identity. One of the claims from his recent book that I find most interesting is this one, where he argues, and I quote, if personal information is finally acknowledged to be constitu a constitutive part of someone's personal identity and individuality, then one day it may become strictly illegal to trade in some kinds of personal information exactly as it is illegal to trade in human organs or, or including one's own or to a trafficking slave. Now I'm not sure I go so far as to draw these analogies. Um, I think they may be over, over, overdrawn. But like Floridi, I can imagine a world in which it might be illegal to trade in certain types of personal information or at least use them without knowledge or consent. Most likely, that would be a world that takes the development and maintenance of personal identity and its importance to the exercise of individual autonomy very seriously indeed. Now, it might be hard to contemplate that world from where we stand now, but I'd like to suggest it's one we need to spend a bit more time imagining. Again, returning to the title of the lecture, we need to ensure that we live in a world where identity is not reduced to the ticking of boxes, but rather embraces the natural tendency to tell stories. And I think that's where I'm probably going to leave things the time and open it up for questions. So thank you. I'd love you to expand on that point you just left on, actually, when you talk about storytelling as a mechanism for defining identity. How do you, how do you, see, that, how do you see that coming to be? In what sense? When you, when you, when you said, just as you were finishing, you were going to read it as yep. storytelling. Right. Where, where was your thought going there? So one, one way of thinking about it is so if your um, discussions around right to be forgotten uh, is, uh, is an interesting way of getting at this. So one of the ways I think we understand ourselves is we understand ourselves as an ongoing narrative where the most recent events are the most important ones. So it's a bit like watching something on television. The most recent episode is the one which we use to inform our feelings about the characters. We might talk about what they did back in series one, but really what they're doing in series five is the most interesting thing. And when we judge them, we tend to judge them by the things that happened in this week's episode rather than the things that they did back in season one. And I think the way we think about ourselves is actually very similar. Um, whilst the things I did when I was 15 or 18 or 24 are part of my identity, I think they're less significant than the things I'm doing now. Or at least I like to think so, I like other people to think so. Um, so that's kind of in an existential way. Yeah. Who are you at the moment depends yeah. largely on where you are in that storytelling timeline. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so the construction of categorical identity runs very counter to that because it doesn't, in a sense, necessarily weight information according to time. Right? So my criminal record 
when I'm 18 in the categorical identity can have as much significance as the fact that I don't commit criminal offences today. Right. Um, and so people who have advocated the right to be forgotten, like the League and others, are often trying to free people um, from the mistakes of the past and to recognise that narrative identities evolve over time and that actually they're a better explanation of how we think about ourselves. Um, but that runs counter to a world in which everything is stored and everything can be maintained and, and passed and transmitted often out of context. And so one of the things I think is, uh, we need to contemplate is a way of giving people control over the information that is more like the way memory and narrative function. Um, is that a mm-hmm. response to the question? That sort of it, it does. So I think one of the challenges you see is that because technology allows us to, at, at any point in a person's story, yep. take an element or a happening of that out of context mm-hmm. and discuss it as if it were yesterday or just this moment, brings all of it out of, out of temporal context. Mm-hmm. I, I think we see that a lot in, in politics and daily life when a person has done something eons ago mm-hmm. and it becomes revealed. Uh, yep. Brian Wilson's um, anchor for NBC News. That, that seems to be pretty topical. Yeah. Oh, William, pardon me. Sorry. Uh, yeah. I think, I think that's absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, please. This is uh, very interesting. Thank you very much for, for all of that. One thing that I, I find that this kind of a, a very useful conceptual framework, and I think it is, at least for me, as a driving, a driving point, is the difference between the public sector and the private sector. Mm-hmm. In the private sector with Facebook, I get to create, I'm the curator of my own narrative. I get to decide what story I'm going to tell exactly as you said about mm-hmm. You can have multiple accounts. This is for the car forums, this is for Facebook, for your family and friends, this is for, for this, that, and the other thing. But but with the government, it's, it's not anywhere near it. Well, there's no consent by and large. And there's also a, a much greater tendency, I think, to categorize. The government wants to say have all this information about all these, all these citizens. They want to data mine for law enforcement or security or whatever. And, and, and they're going to take all that information they're going to categorize. And one thing that I think is kind of interesting in connection with, with, with the, the temporal aspect, and I'm sure I guess this is more of a comment than a question, is that kind of online advertising, the fact that I bought parts for a 1993 saw 15 years ago, is of course going to vaporize into the memory because showing the ads about that is going to be completely useless. But somebody who is not as kind of constrained by that sort of stuff, like the government, for example, this is a guy who bought parts for a 1993 job. I haven't owned a 1993 job in, in 15 years. But so, it, 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 at least to me, it's a very different context. I can choose not to have a Facebook account. I can choose mm-hmm. not to log into Google. I can choose to use the kind of private browsing tab or, or whatever in those sorts of contexts. And, and so, but, but often, the two are kind of conflated and are seen mm-hmm. to overlap in, in ways, at least to me, I, I don't see the same sort of overlap. No, I think that's a very good point. I think you're largely right. But there are elements of the way in which we interact with the state that aren't quite like that. So, I'm trying to think of an example that may, may make this plan. So, I can use a personal example. So, when I lived in the United States, uh, I, uh, many, many years ago, I contemplated the potential of living there for a long time. And so, I put in a green card application in August of 2001 uh, in my local uh, immigration centre, which was in Harlem in New York City. Um, December 11th happened, and as you can imagine, lots of government services are ground to a halt, particularly services around immigration. Um, so by the time uh, my green card application started to pick up pace again and move, I'd already left the United States. Um, I'd moved back to England, I'd taken up a new job, and I had no interest. Uh, my lawyer also passed away, unbeknownst to me, uh, while this was happening, so I didn't get any communication with my lawyer either. Uh, and and uh, at some point, uh, some years later, I realised that I actually had to abandon the application. That actually, if you, there's, a, there's a time limit, if you leave it running, uh, it can create some problems. So, in, in my immigration file, I have an abandoned green card application, um, which is very interesting to immigration officers who are in a bad mood with you. <laughs> so, the one time where I challenged a TSA officer who I thought was violating my privacy on other fronts, um, which you don't do very often, I don't recommend, uh, <laughs> my abandoned green card application became very important and led to a one-hour interrogation at uh, an, an airport with why did you abandon it, what were you doing, uh, what do you do, well I work on surveillance and security, oh, <laughs> oh. and you moved to United States when, oh I moved there in August 2001 and you left, you know, etc. Et uh, it was fine, I mean of course it, it ended with nothing, I had nothing, there was no problem and I explained it simply to the news for the thing, but, but it was a good example of where actually the file had never been updated and never been put in context, that identity, that identity of the uh, that the Immigration Service has of me 
Uh, and that baptism bank is still in there. I don't know the notes that the TFSA agent wrote on my file, if any. I suspect probably none. Um, and so that abandoned green card exhortation stays with me forever. Um, there's very little opportunity for me to remedy it or change the story around it and to tell the story around it. Because when you tell the story around it, it makes complete sense. But, but to my point, yep. there's a section that has checked the box next to your application mm -hmm. inferring something about it that wasn't within your control yes. to, to, to cure it. Yes. And, so, uh, the one argument is that you try and, well, this is my argument why we should have more informational self determination in the context of categorical identity. I should be able to see that file and have that deleted. Right? That would be my argument. Actually, it's no longer relevant. It meant it was entirely an administrative piece. It had said nothing about my eligibility to return to the United States. It said nothing about my behavior in the United States. It was purely a function of a, uh, a, a time that ran out. Right? It has no, had no broader meaning than that, unlike, say, being denied a visa. Right? which maybe you could argue has some qualitative things to say about me as a person and maybe goes to my risk, right, to the state. But it's not the case in relation to this administrative change. So the argument in favour of sort of more informational sort of information in the state is just trying to correct the categorical identity is one thing. I think it's a limited. Right? It's actually, that information shouldn't be kept, right? It's no longer relevant to anything going forward. It should be deleted, right? So the state doesn't like to do that. It likes to build up an increasingly uh, detailed categorical identity. But the problem if you have multiple interactions with state over a very, very long period of time, the inaccuracies grow and they compound, right? So uh, the fact that I have an abandoned green card application could also be uh, counted against the fact that I come and go to the United States all the time, right? I'm, I actually live in Vancouver. I travel to Seattle regularly because I have family there. Now, suddenly you can imagine, well, why, why if this person spends a lot of time in the United States, they abandon the green card application? Why didn't they just try and revive it and continue it? Well, the reason for me is I don't want to pay U.S. taxes, right? My, my partner's a U.S. citizen. We do enough of her taxes every year despite the fact we don't live in the United States. I have no great desire to do them myself. So I don't want, to, I don't want permanent residence in the United States. But that's a question someone might ask. Right? So there are all sorts of really... So the, net, the problem with the categorical is it doesn't have enough information in it in many respects. Now, one argument that I was rehearsing when I was writing this lecture is, well, maybe what you do is you actually try and allow more leakage between my narrative identity in the private sector and my categorical identity in the state sector. So that would be a good thing. Um, but then you start to end up in this world that sort of this, uh, the, um, the creators of Facebook start to imagine where all these identities are connected. Right? And then maintaining context becomes incredibly difficult. And maintaining ownership and control becomes incredibly difficult. And you also start to see the collapse of those different social spheres. Right? Um, a fascinating thing is Google+. Plus. If any, I mean, not many people use Google+. It was one of those great <laughs> things Google rolled out. A lot of us signed up and then nobody else did and you kind of don't use it very often. Um, but Google+, Plus is really interesting because Google thinks of social networks in terms of spheres. Right? You put people literally into circles. And people can be members of multiple circles. Right? I can have my, my partner, I can be a member of my family circle, but you can also be a member of my friend's circle. But members of my family aren't necessarily in my friend's circle and vice versa. It actually is very interesting. It does it kind of replicates the way in which we think about social selves. It's also quite complicated and hard to manage and most people think, oh, I'll just use Facebook, right? But it's an interesting. Now, one argument is you could have the state circle and the private circle, private sector circles overlapping in really quite constructive ways to allow my narrative from one place to pass into the categorical and into another. So there's all sorts of problems with that too. So I take your point. I mean, there's a very, the state does it differently because I'm always responding to it rather than it responding to me, I think. Um, so I'll take the one up here and I'll come in. How do you imagine, I hope I can find the right words for this question, but how do you imagine um, information self-determination playing out on the field of evidence? So, for example, say you have a young, foolish young person, 16 years old, he's on Facebook, and uh, he posts all kinds of things saying, you know, I'm hardcore and I do all these really cool things or whatever, and he ends up in trouble with the cops. The cops say, well, this guy must be in trouble. But really it turns out he's just trying to impress some girls, say. Right? Um, and he argues, to bring him to some hypothetical court, he argues that, oh, no, it wasn't for real. I was just trying to impress someone. So that would be the kind of informational self-determination he's trying to exercise for himself, whereas the state would say, no, this is evidence that you're a very sketchy person, and that you should bring it. Yeah, I mean, that's a, I guess the lawyer in me goes to, goes to the thought that unless they're actually doing something rather than just saying something, that's not enough to ground criminal liability. So the state shouldn't be that interested anyway. I can say all sorts of things, right? That's what free speech is about. I can say I want to overturn the government. I can say I wish that bad things happened to certain people. Um, 
But I have to take certain steps. I have to add things to those languages. I have to frame the language in very particular ways to really engage the state. The state has a legitimate interest in managing risk. So it'd be foolish if the state didn't sort of take seriously some of the things that people say in certain contexts. But your example, I would hope that we live in a world where the state just says, well, you know, people say all sorts of stuff. But you need more than simply a statement. You need acts. You need, uh, in the words, you know, in the language of law, you need to do more than, more than mere preparation to actually start thinking about criminal liability. Right? I mean, conspiracy is a different matter. Right? Once you start saying, sharing people saying, I think we should overthrow the government. Yeah, I think so too. I think that would be a great idea. Why don't we meet on Tuesday at a coffee shop and talk about that? Right? The meeting at the coffee shop on Tuesday actually starts to look a little bit more like preparatory stuff. And then we meet at the coffee shop and we say, oh, why don't we go and buy some stuff that might actually help us do that? Right? Looks different. But I do think, I mean, there's a, there's a conflation, right? Because we, we're telling the stories, often we tell telling accurate stories about ourselves. We lie. We fabricate. We exaggerate. Um, we we are just we self justify we do all those things, right? That's, that's part of the building up of identity. No, I mean, most of us have a self-conception and recognise that we tell lies to ourselves, right? And thankfully, the reflective nature of the social self allows other people to tell us when we're telling lies and reflect upon those lies and do all those things. The state shouldn't face those stories as facts. They should see them as representations. Right? That's, that's the difference. I think the danger is categorical identities get made out of facts. Or they get made out of representations that turn into facts. Right? When I present myself at the border, I'm representing myself in a particular way, which the state turns into a fact about me. Right? Um, and that, that, that becomes a problem. Um, yeah, please. Um, I just want to hear more comments from you on something you just said. Um, I think answering your question was um, you make comments about joining the state and private identities together, and then you analogize those Google circles and so on. What would your comment be on whether or not you see that likely driving additional suspicion by the state, or or an increase in an increase in their confrontational assertiveness, or investigative interest in you, um, because there's a lack of verifiable trust or verifiable facts between one's private identity and one's public identity. In other words, if you take all of this and put it together, the state will have lost its trust that the information it's got was trustworthy to begin with, because now it's coming from sources other than what they control. Yeah, and so I should, I mean, I should back up and say I'm not, uh, I think the dangers of allowing the state to move, have access to my public identities are far outweigh any benefits. But often, I mean, one thing is that the state does it anyway. Right? There's no sure. illusions. So the, 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 state, the state most interested in people goes on Facebook. It, goes, it does all sorts of things to try and get that information to contextualise things it already knows or to add uh, to uh, the stories it already thinks it's if not. Um, the, I guess if we, if, if we accept in a sort of defeatist way that that's something we can't stop, the state will do that anyway. But you might argue that actually the thing to do is to say, well, we need to know how it's happening. We need to have managed processes by which it's happening. We need to be able to trace the sources of information. Um, one of the things that uh, you mentioned in the, the bio, uh, the introduction earlier that I, I did work on undercover policing, one of the things that's really interested me about the police is they often decontextualise information deliberately. Um, one of the things we've found in the field work is that when police officers get together and try and talk about the different sorts of information they have, be it surveillance, informers, etc., what they now uh, do in England is in those briefings, the individuals presenting the information are not allowed to say where it comes from. You can't... Pardon? They're not allowed to say where it comes from. They're not allowed to say, well, my informer told me this, or this person... Uh, uh, this witness told me this, or we saw this on the cameras. They just present the information uh, as best they can without the context. And the reason for that is, is they were finding that the source of information was heavily weighting the way they understood it and, and the meaning they attached to it. So older uh, officers less comfortable with uh, surround technology were more inclined to believe informers and to give weight to that information than, say, younger officers who were more inclined to believe the things that they got on wiretaps on cameras. Um, and so there's an argument to say that, well, this information is going to flow uh, from the private into the public sector or from, the, from my, my Facebook identity into my categorical identity. There needs to be a way of verifying it. The police actually need to be able to, or the state needs to be able to have a way of determining whether the information they're using is actually valuable, useful, verifiable. Right? Now, that's, I don't know how to broach that. Um, but it's kind of important to think that the it is. investigation. Yes. 
on, our, on a, a reasonable suspicion or what have you, yep. and this kind of intelligence gathering where you're sucking it all in and, and you're doing all this kind of analysis with no, with no reasonable basis to, to do that. Co collection well, of analysis to follow. Kind yeah. of well, story. that's it, and, and, and without any context, because obviously context is incredibly important. Yeah. A criminal informant compared to a wiretap compared to CCTV yeah. has different reliability, but subtracting that reliability is just kind of a thing that everything is everything is equally credible, which is not which is not the case. And without any nuance, you're going to easily categorize rather than understand really where where does this fit into? Is this a teenager that's trying to impress a girl, or is it somebody who's actually about to, to do a conspiracy? And now we have, and it's not just the criminal charges; it's the do not fly list, mm -hmm. which are kind of quasi judicial, but decisions that are made by functionaries that have a significant impact on people. I think that's right, and I think that's I think that's absolutely right, and I think the the piece that's interesting is that the distinction between information gathering and intelligence creation, right? That they're different, right? We gather information for the purpose of generating intelligence, which can provide the basis for decisions. What state agencies, agencies and I include the police in this, but security services often do is they conflate the two, right? They think that <coughs> generating more information in and of itself produces intelligence, right? Which is a fundamental misunderstanding, right? Um, and I think, to some extent, the construction of categorical identities often relies on that. I think if we put more stuff into the bucket, right, the thing that comes out of the bucket will be more valuable to us. Right? We tip it out; something can fall on the floor, this sort of form thing that will enable us to form uh, form decisions. That's not how it works, right? And I think that's something that uh, we need to remember when we look at how these information gathering techniques uh, are used. Um, to some extent, the debate gets sort of circumvented. We talk about algorithmic phenomena. So, well, we've, we've found ways to do this in a sort of uh, instantiated, technologically driven way. But of course, those algorithms are written by people. The variables in the algorithm are weighted by decisions that people have made. Right? The value on X and the value on Y is a product of somebody's choice. It didn't just happen. Um, and arguably, when you mask it, when you put those things into algorithms, you actually mask them. But they're less obvious than if it's purely someone actually trying to make a decision about um, information. But the point of, of I mean, I think one of the things I struggle with is how to make sense of the categorical identity in the state and how you can both resist it, right, because I think actually as they become more textured and more complicated, they become more of a threat because they become harder to resist. Um, most, I mean, a lot of, many of us, and myself included, have, have rarely had experiences where the state believes something about us is really untrue, right? But you'll hear accounts of people, particularly in the immigration field, which is now where I'm looking at, where people spend many, many, many years of their lives trying to displace the view that the state has formed them based on information they believe to be incorrect. Right? And at that point, your categorical identity is you. Right? It doesn't matter how many times you stand in front of the state agent or you go to the tribunal and say, look, this didn't happen. This is not what, this is not what I did. The assumption is the file is correct. The categorical identity of you that exists is the right one. Um, and I think that's a, as the information in the identity gets more and more granular, the capacity to displace it or to resist it when you're in that power relationship becomes less and less and less. And so I think, I, I guess the argument of informational self-determination is to say you need to give people more ownership of that information at the very beginning to stop it, stop being contribu contributing to that, that, that false identity, I guess. Um, so I know you've been waiting, I apologize. Uh, thanks. Second time, you know, um, my question really was about Mm -hmm. yep. And we haven't done a thing with them since, mm -hmm. probably because 
Yep. Now, people are talking about a harm state yep. approach to a data protection now, which is a joke, because if you couldn't prove harm in the 70s, you sure as heck can't prove it now with the data mining. I have no metrics for the validity of the data that's being used and being told, well, go for the algorithm itself mm -hmm. and try and find it. So, got any thoughts on how that could work? I, I mean, I think it could work. I was listening to CDC this morning interviewing somebody who was in trouble on child pornography laws um, pre-decided bullying and she was all coming in. This is just an exciting perfection data. Yeah. Well, it's a classic invasion of privacy. We have a tort law that could go under that. You know, they don't need to go to child pornography mm -hmm. for that particular instance. Um, anyway, frustration. Yeah, no, those are great. Those are great questions, and I think starting with the second one first. I mean, the, the tort. So when we think about torts of privacy, we're thinking, talking, particularly talking about violations of privacy into, into the seclusion, right? There's no notion that I've separated myself and someone has stepped into that sphere, and that's the violation. The harm derives from that, and I think what I'm talking about informational self determination, saying it's something more akin to misuse of my property, right? Now, quantifying the harm of that's very difficult too, right? Because what I'd like to say is it shouldn't just be information that's confidential or commercially valuable, right? But rather it could be, it could be things that are constituted as me, right? So the taking of information which might be mundane about me in one context and putting it somewhere else, right? That, that strikes me uh, that that represents a misappropriation of my information. It, it represents uh, a threat to my identity. Now, how the courts deal with that in terms of harm, I'm not sure, right? One idea is they actually use the word penalty damages, right? So they're actually going to make a symbolic statement. You just don't get to do this for other people's property. Right? Yes, it's true the individual hasn't suffered a physical injury, and yes, it's true they haven't suffered a loss of reputation or to harm their commercial interest in the way we think about defamation. We can say as a symbolic statement that state, we believe through the courts that actually doing this is wrong, and we're going to find you, right? Or we're going to give injunctive relief. We're actually going to say, look, get rid of the information, strip it away, take it off your site, publish an apology. Public, you know, we can think of all sorts of things one might do. Um, I do think. Uh, Courts of privacy are generally underused, um, partly because I think the, the public has a real understand, a problem understanding what the, the value of privacy is. And one of the things I've found uh, very difficult in my short time talking about privacy uh, in public is trying to get people who don't spend all their lives thinking about it, trying to understand why it matters. Right? This is why I'm, I no longer go on radio stations to argue with people about privacy, because you can't get the soundbite explanation. You can't do it. The person who's arguing about more security, and I've had those discussions in television and elsewhere up many times, they always get you. So we want a little bit of privacy for more security. What, who could argue with that? So, well, I could, but I, I need three or four minutes. <laughs> right? I'm not going to get that. I need to get 20 seconds. Well, it's about autonomy and dignity, and sorry, we're done. Right? <laughs> and to some extent, uh, the court suffers from the same problem. Right? It doesn't get used because people don't, don't think about the violation of their privacy is actually a meaningful harm. And what I think we do need to recast this in is that actually, these are not just harms in terms of your seclusion. I mean, not just about someone entering into your space, be it physical or, or somehow uh, virtual. It's about somebody taking something from you right, and using it in a way that you didn't consent to. And I think framing it in terms of property in that way may actually be easier for people to understand. Particularly, more and more of us are actually experiencing the sharing of that information online. Right? I think one of the benefits of online identities or social media is people are actually starting to think about identity in the ways that actually philosophers have talked about it for a very long time. So you hear people say, well, I'm, you know, actually one, one that's always, I think, is great as my students, right? Some of them try to friend you on Facebook while you're teaching them, right? <laughs> I always say, no, I don't want to know. Actually, I, I really don't want to know about you on Facebook because I suspect your, your identity on Facebook is not necessarily one you always want me to know about. Uh, and vice versa, I'm not interested in friending my students because I don't want them to know about me on Facebook either. I think we're, I'm a different person in that sphere from the one I am in the classroom. Uh, I don't want my students to know my political views for that, for one thing. I don't think it's relevant and I think it actually can have chilling effects. Uh, and vice versa, I don't want to know the political views of my students right, unless they're relevant to the thing I'm teaching, right, I mean, which can in a very constrained, managed way. And so, so I think my, people are beginning to understand that. Right? I think, as I've taught, Fewer and fewer and fewer of my students actually try to friend me on Facebook. Now, it might be because I'm just not as friendly as I was once upon a time. And, <laughs> and as I get older, the age gap between us, I don't think I use technology or Facebook. And, and, and they, 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 they always 
sort of give a gasp and I can turn on the computer and think that's wonderful. Um, <laughs> but I actually like to think it's because people are becoming more thoughtful about those identities. But I think actually one of the, the, the sort of ancillary effects of the pervasiveness of social media is people are actually thinking about identity in more subtle and sophisticated ways. So I think there is a, there's a window of opportunity there to get people to actually engage with it and this is why I think there's a chance for a tort. Um, with regards to the, the validity, data validity question, it's a really great question and I don't even begin to know how you assess that. I, one of the things that I think, if I go back to Amazon, they have valid data about me because their predictions are almost always right. The ten, and I joke, the 10 books that they sent me this morning, in between breakfast and, and you know, uh, after breakfast, I sat down and I spent 20 minutes looking at those books. Eight out of the 10 I'm actually going to buy. Yeah. Because they, yeah. I was like, yeah, I still need to read these. These are really, yeah. Six of them I should have read before I walked in here. But, <laughs> but, that's too late. But, but it was right. And in fact, because I've been using Amazon for a long time and I buy a lot of books through Amazon and, and now I've got a Kindle, I, I buy even more because it's so, so easy. Um, it re it's the frequency, the vol like the, the repetition of data points, right? That gives us incredibly uh, accurate predictive power. Now, I also think that that profile can tell you a lot about my political views, can tell you a lot about my career, can tell you, you can tell when I shifted from security to privacy because I start buying lots of books about privacy and I bought fewer books about security. You can tell when I had children, right? I buy fewer books than what books I buy about parenting and sleep. How do I get to sleep? <laughs> right? Uh, so, so there's all, but it's the frequency, right? I don't think Amazon, I know Amazon has complicated algorithms, but their data points are quite, they're quite limited, right? It's a, it's a binary, it's a purchase decision. But it's a purchase decision in the context of many purchase decisions. So there's an argument to say that actually the value of the data can come from its frequency. Now, I, I don't have much more to say than that. I don't, I think, well, um, I, mean, I think on the Amazon version, it's validation. validation. Of course, it's a free... There's millions of customers that they can look to, yes. and they say, well, we're going to show these books to this person, and we'll yep. buy them. Yep. And, and they get a yes or no out of that. Yes. The government says, oh, here, we're going to analyze all this data and figure out who's going to be terrorists. Yep. And do they have, it's not that people kind of click, yes, I'm a terrorist. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and so they don't have that sort of validation, so, so they choose the, the, their category are so incredibly spotty yeah. and it's so much gray area where if you can do kind of any B test on I mean, a real kind of commercial context, we're going to show this sort of ad to this person whether yeah. they click on it or not. They, they know that right away through millions of impressions of government information. Just a massive amount of suppositions yeah. and inferences that are mostly bullshit. Yeah, but that's an argument in favor of, I mean, I completely agree with you, right? But that's an argument in favor of more self-determination in the government in the state sphere. Because actually, if you think about it, if we step back from the, the opposition relationship that I've explained about the state, right? The state potentially oppressing or, or categorizing or well, reducing the... Well, no, no, because I think it's important because I like to think I live in a liberal democratic state which I should kind of be on board with. But the state, I have an interest in the state having a categorical identity or a profile that is actually accurate. And not just accurate, but actually might be textured and thoughtful, right? And so... Given me the capacity to actually look at the profile and the inferences that are drawn from the same, yeah, that's reasonable, that's fair, that's not, right? That one, you, you've kind of misunderstood this data, right? And I go back to my immigration example. A benign conversation with immigration officers say, yeah, you don't really need to keep asking me about this because actually it doesn't, it's not relevant to the questions you're asking. You, you, know, you can ask me other ones, there are lots of, and there's other information you might want to get from me, but this is the wrong, wrong track to go down. And in fact, you're wasting resources talking to me. Right, this is the other thing, this is the security part of me, is that the state's in efforts of profiling um, direct resources away from things that they could be doing. This is why um, I think it was Bernard Harcourt at Chicago a few years ago uh, suggested that actually profiling is much more effective when it's random. So actually, yeah. statistically, it just works better when it's random. Because targeted profiling is almost always wrong. Right? Both because the data you're using is usually wrongly interpreted, but also the subjects you're directed at are moving targets. Right? When you start to profile one group, the group shifts. Right? Uh, and terrorists and, and people who are genuine security threats are well known to be aware, to try and stay ahead of the targeting game. Right? So uh, I think actually information, argue, putting more emphasis on information self determination has beneficial effects. It allows me to remedy uh, the state's profile. I mean, it allows me to develop a relationship with the state of saying, it's in our interest for you to have a 
have an identity from me that's actually accurate. Um, it's why, I mean, I think it's also mentioned before, I used to work on identity cards. Uh, I had the privilege of, of, of being advised of the government and I got to be the person in the room who just got to ask difficult questions of people. And, and the, the thing we kept coming back to was identity cards um, aren't necessarily a bad thing, provided the information on them is useful, right? And the information on them is open and accessible to people so they can correct it if it's wrong, right? There's lots of reasons why you want these things to link to health records. It's to my benefit, if my health records might be linked to a card I carry on my body and is readily accessible to my doctor or some other doctor. In the same way as the health records of my children, being able to access them through my identity card might be useful in certain circumstances. Um, where it's not useful is where it's wrong, right? Uh, and so, uh, the argue, and we also we had a long discussion about uh, whether we should keep people's DNA on in connection with these cards. And the other was, well, it's fine to keep everybody, right? DNA profiling is actually less objective with everybody. If we have selected populations represented in DNA databases and linked to identity cards, you get problems because they become the target of exclusionary uh, processes. They become targets of suspicion more often. So if you want to have it, you've got to have it for everybody, right? In the same way, if you want to have certain types of information, you want to have it for everybody. That, to some extent, smooths out some of the potential discriminatory effects. It doesn't eliminate them, but it speaks to some of them. No, that's right. Yeah, please. Uh, just just as, a, as a point, you talked about Amazon yeah. and their accuracy. And part of the problem with people's perception of the profiles is that you suggest that you think that it's just about your purchase history. Yes. It's not even close to the. Yes. Their accuracy is not. It's, it's, your purchase history is actually only a very small part yep. of what Amazon is using to create that profile. True. It's actually your web browsing history. Yep. For every time they see you cooking. Your purchase history, unless you turned off location information on yep. your Kindle, is where you have to go. Yep. So they might be accurate, but they're actually not because of the No, that's true. Well, it's fine. It's fine. No, that's absolutely right. That's a, that's a very good point. No, that's a, even for someone like me who has every add on you could possibly imagine on his browser and every privacy thing running and cooking, you know, I have no illusions that lots of information is linking uh, across lots of different places. Um, and you're right, it's not just my purchase history, it's where I was, when I did it. Uh, how much I spent. But the other thing is also, mm -hmm. um, no, no illusions, Amazon can trace my income, my salary changes. I could do that very easily. I bought more books when I got my first job. One of the first things I did when I got my first paycheck was go out and buy some books. Mm -hmm. Not something you get to do as a student very often. Uh, quite, quite a wonderful time. Uh, but <laughs> Amazon knows that. You can see a spike, right? You can see, uh, and you can see the location where it happened. But you're absolutely right. Um, I guess my point is that you, there is a passage that the data, I think there's a tendency to think of the profiles as somehow inaccurate. And I don't think that my experience is they're not, actually. As much as I'd like to think Amazon doesn't know me as well as some of my friends do, friends do, it knows me better than some of my friends. If, they, if I could have a conversation with Amazon, it would probably be more interesting about <laughs> politics. Because, because actually, Amazon knows what I'm interested in. Right? Anyway. My point is that there's yeah. a much more invasive. No, you're absolutely right. No, it isn't. I, I, we know a lot about it, not because of just the information that we're knowing and giving. That's what I can appreciate. I've watched these books, you know, uh, that I'm earning more of the kind of things that I'm interested in. Yeah. But any time that, but there, any time that Amazon cookie goes across multiple web, yeah. websites, they know all the other sites that I happen to visit along Yeah. Time. And that's why an argument in favour of a, a strong load of information source determination might be useful. So actually, every time you pass that information, every time a cookie moves, or whatever, whatever the right uh, verb for cookies is, um, I should know about it. Or certainly if I don't know about it and I find out afterwards, you should be able to account for it. The other thing, I mean, I, I had these discussions with Kevin Haggerty, uh, University of Alberta, many, many years ago, about whether you could actually turn that information into microtransactions. So every time a cookie in relation to me gets passed, I get paid. Um, now, I thought that was kind of strange. I, I've often thought that was an unworkable idea uh, until I started getting checks uh, from a copyright agency in the United Kingdom. Um, I get a check every year uh, to compensate me for the number of times my works have been photocopied. I have no idea how they work this out. I've never asked because I keep getting checks and it seems like if I ask them, I'd stop. Um, <laughs> but, but I get them, right? I assume they're extrapolating based on microtransactions. They're working out some sort of algorithm so it's roughly what we think, how often we think his information is being replicated and we think we want to pay him. I signed up for this thing many, many years ago and ever since then I've been getting these small checks. Um, I can imagine services like Amazon doing something similar. 
if they want to use my information in past, they pay me micro fractions of a cent every time it gets passed. At the end of the year, I get 50 bucks. You know, we use your information, we share it in all sorts of ways, we get compensation for you. Right? Now, it sounds really so fanciful and weird. Can you just get paid by Amazon by the Facebook recommendation? I do. I mean, you say, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm going to pay them too, right? Because yeah. I'm <laughs> going to borrow those books. Uh, I can see Madeline moving slowly towards the table. We've been to use our time for one more question, okay. and hopefully some friends will have a spoken word if anyone has an answer question. I'd like to take you back to your notion of personal information of property. Yeah. Um, and, you know, public court. Probably the closest analogy I can think of is maybe trespass. Yes. So, but even in trespass, depending on what the action is, there would be different, um, different punishments or different um, different um, consequences for that. But if you but you use that and analogize that with the misuse of personal information, mm-hmm. it still really sort of comes down to the the willing act of the perpetrator, the harm that comes to the individual, um, whether it's repeated or not. So if someone crosses my property at two o'clock in the afternoon and there's a big big corner. I don't care what judge you get, they're not going to slap that individual with anything. But if they keep doing it every day and you start doing it at 11 o'clock at night and you're standing out there with a flashlight pointing to you my house, but you could see, so you could sit there and don't forget about individuals, do since individuals, but take that private sector context. I still struggle with how moving away from the harm suffered or the abusive behavior of the person doing the action. What more could there be if you convert your information into property? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. I, a couple of things to say. One is, I think where, this, where we need to start is by thinking about it as a right. right. So when you, and people talk about rights all the time, the one thing you forget about rights is not for me to explain or justify why you, why you can't infringe the right. In fact, you can argue that I don't have to demonstrate harm. The mere infringement in and of itself is a harm. Even if, even if actually, I'm not troubled by it. Because the whole notion of a right is you have to explain why you get to do this certain thing. Right? That's one way to think about it. So a property right, I can enforce a property right even if my property is not damaged. Right? Trespass, you don't have to harm my property for me to bring a right. You can actually trespass against it. Now, the court may not compensate me or make it worth my while to go to court, mm-hmm. but the property right exists. I'm not sure trespass is the way to think about it, because then you can end up with this sort of argument about violation and, and this notion of intrusion. I like to think about, one way I think about might be the way in which we think about works of art. If I think about my identity and all the information that goes into it, it's a bit like a work of art, albeit a rather haphazard, poorly done one. Um, people don't get to modify it, right? People don't necessarily get to change it and then replicate it and promulgate it, right? Because might say, well, that's mine. Right? That piece of art is an expression of me. Right? My interest in it derives from that, even if, uh, even if um, you might not think it's particularly valuable, it's valuable to me. And so you have to, in this sense, explain why you're allowed to do that. And if you're not, you don't have a sufficiently good explanation, you can't do it anymore. Right? And again, I come back to this thing, I think the tort, such as you might expect, wouldn't necessarily get that damage if there's that injunctive relief. Right? I think that's where actually you go with it. To say, actually, you're just going to take it to do this. Mm-hmm. You continue to do it, and I just said, like, trust us. Then we start finding, we start punitive the damages. But the yeah, first protocol call might be injunctive relief, because actually, don't represent me in this other place. Don't uh, share my information. Don't pass this identity to another place. But you don't think you can do that under existing law? Like under precedent today, you probably could get three different, right? I can do it if I don't. You continued or was shown. I asked you once, twice, three times, and you still keep doing it. A judge probably would slap them or something. But I have to go through a regulator, right? I have to make a complaint to a body who has to take it forward. Who has to. So what I think actually is the right, if it's a right, yeah. it has to be vested with me. I need to be able to go to the court too. Right? The regulator can do... I, I think it's... It basically tells you you have to go to the regulator first and then afterwards you can go straight. But that's not an insignificant route. Right? Well, I mean, I'm not suggesting it's not an important and effective one. But if I believe it's a right, it's a personal right. It's not a right that's contingent on the capacity of the regulator or contingent on the decision of the regulator no matter how much confidence I have in the <laughs> regulator. The same is true about human rights commissions. Right? I, this is the human rights lawyer getting up on his soapbox. I fundamentally object to the notion I have to enforce, I have to uh, pursue my human rights through a third party. Right? My human rights are my rights. The commission doesn't give them to me by choosing to take my case forward. Right? And there's lots of jurisdictions where that's the case. 
my rights need to be able to be important and bind me directly. That's why they're my rights. And so I think when you mediate it through, aside from the fact that we're passive in terms that regulators are almost always underfunded, they're almost always having to make cost-benefit decisions about what things they pursue, and they're massively outgunned uh, by the individuals or by the organisations they're against. I think individuals, if you give them a property right, eventually you get individuals who have the resources to actually take it forward. So this is the other thing that you start to see uh, often these torts get pursued by people who have the legal resources to actually... Class action. Yeah, and class action. So it has... Not, and they're not, they're not either or, but I think there's a supplement. So I'd like to say, well, you know, I, I to, I'm annoyed enough, I'm not even going to bother going to the regulator. I'm going to go out this person myself. As a law professor, I've plenty of time. Uh, I'm going <laughs> to... <laughs> I'm going to give this to my class as a project. <laughs> so there's a, it's a good, I, there are problems. I'm not suggesting. I mean, I think what I'm suggesting is these are things to think seriously about as, as possibilities for the future. So you know, just to clarify, I'm not suggesting that we end the lecture. I'm just suggesting that we continue the conversation in an environment where everybody has a glass of wine. Oh, I love this um, but before we move to phase two of the conversation, I would like to invite everybody to join me in thanking uh, Dr. Benjamin, who was a very similar.